All right, Terry Verts, welcome to the show. It is very good to be with you guys. So you are an astronaut, an International Space Station commander, and you got a book out, How to Astronaut, An Insider's Guide to Leaving the Planet Earth. But what I love about this was a fun read because it answers all those questions that you had when you were a kid about what's it like to work in outer space, what's it like to be an astronaut. But also, I think the big takeaway that I got from this book as I read it as an adult and how I can apply this. I mean, obviously I probably won't go to space. Who knows? Elon Musk might make that happen for me. He might. But it's like, right, he might. But this idea of skill acquisition, like I was just really impressed with how many things you had to learn as an astronaut. So before we get into that, let's talk about your career as an astronaut. How long you've been an astronaut and what missions have you flown? Right. So I showed up at NASA in 2000 and I actually left in 2016. So I left a few years ago and I flew two missions during that time. I went up on Space Shuttle Endeavor, on a two-week flight, and then I went back a few years later with the Russians on a Soyuz for Expedition 42 and 43, and that was a 200-day flight. So I spent a little over seven months in space total. And so let's talk about, how to, is this something you always wanted to do as a kid? Because I know every kid probably had that, I want to be an astronaut moment when they were asked in second grade. Right. Like, did you have that and you like set a plan, like, I'm going to, this is what I'm going to do this and do this and do this next to become an astronaut? I did. <laughs> so as a, as a little kid, I was just fascinated. I read a book about Apollo. That was the first book I ever read. So I grew up with posters of airplanes and rockets and galaxies. And, you know, that's what covered my room, all the walls in my room. And I I read a book called The Right Stuff when I was 13. And that really showed the way, you know, the early astronauts had been fighter pilots and test pilots and went to NASA. And so I didn't know anything about it. I was the first, you know, my mom and dad didn't go to college. And I was kind of the first person in this career path. And so I taught myself the stuff I needed to do. And it, it started off at the Air Force Academy. I was an F-16 pilot and eventually an astronaut. No, yeah. I, was, I saw that you went to the Air Force Academy. I remember when I was a kid, I had that plan. I was like, I'm going to go to the Air Force Academy and become a fighter pilot so I can become an astronaut. And I remember I had this moment, <laughs> I went to the Air Force Academy and they were talking about like what it takes to be. And I think I was like 13. I was like, yeah, I don't know if this is for me. <laughs> and that killed it. It's definitely, it's a good place to be from. <laughs> <laughs> right. Not necessarily a good place to be at, but uh, yeah, it was just, it was one of the steps along the way. And I mean, I'm so thankful I went there, but you brought up an interesting point. People always say, how long does it take to be an astronaut? How long is the training? And the, you know, you, when you get to NASA, you're an ask him. They want to make you feel special. So you're an astronaut candidate. They call you an ask him. <laughs> so you do that for about a year and a half or so. But the reality is it's a lifelong process. It's a lifetime of learning. It started when I was a little kid. You know, my parents supported me. I got a telescope. They didn't know anything about it, so I had to teach myself how to use a telescope. I got a camera. They weren't photographers, so I had to learn focus and exposure and all that stuff. They got me a TRS-80 computer when I was a little kid. Well, probably in middle school, I guess. So I had to teach myself basic because the computer wouldn't do anything. There was no memory or anything. So you turn it on. And if you wrote a program, it would do something. Other than that, it just didn't do anything. So I had to teach myself basic. So that learning to learn, you know, and enjoying learning started when I was a little kid and it's still going on today. And it's really a lifelong process. It's not just like one specific career path. Well, it seems like one of the the big skills you have to have as an astronaut is learning how to learn, like that metacognition or that meta learning. It's like I said, it's lifelong. It's so important. And there's a lot of professions where there's a specific thing you do. Like if you want to be a dentist, you go, th- there's a path, you learn your training, and then you kind of do the same thing forever. If you're an accountant, you go through business school and you pass the CPA and you know you probably do the same thing forever. But when you're an astronaut, it's not like in Star Trek where everybody has a different color shirt and you know that you know the red guys are going to go get killed by the aliens and the, <laughs> right. the yellow guys in charge and the blue guys, the doctor that's because they had a hundred people on enterprise, right? For the space station, we only had a handful of people. So everybody had to do everything. I was the crew medical officer. I was the dentist. I did a filling in space. It was the first ever filling. I did, you know, maintenance on equipment. I did spacewalks. I did 250 different experiments on science experiments. And I'm not a PhD. Even if you are a PhD, if you're the world's expert in, you know, genetic microbiology, whatever, there may be one experiment in that, that that'll be great for you. But the other 249, you're not a PhD in. And so my point is astronauts have to be very broad based. Like you have to be able to do, be reasonably good at everything. You don't have to be the world's expert really in anything, but 
it is definitely a different skill set than than many normal jobs. I think. So you said you joined NASA in two thousand. How long did it take you before you went on your your first mission? Oh, <laughs> great question. Forever. So. There were several things that built up. First of all, NASA just hired way too many people. Between 95 and 2000, they hired 125 astronauts because we're building the space station and the space shuttle is flying seven people at a time and all this stuff was going on. Well, they had some mechanical problems that really slowed down the shuttle flight rate. And then the Columbia accident happened, the tragedy, and that slowed things down by a couple of years. And then NASA management decided that space station flights were so complicated that only experienced astronauts could fly on them. So the rookies just ground to a halt. So for folks in my class and the class before me, I think everybody waited somewhere between eight and 12 years to fly. So it was a long wait, but it was worth it. I mean, it was the most amazing experience you can imagine, but it was definitely a long wait. And, you know, you just, you had to keep your head up and of all the things that people suffer in the world, you know, working at NASA as an astronaut waiting to fly is not the worst. And so, um, you know, all of us ended up surviving that and, and the wait was worth it. And I mean, what did you do during that time? So what kind of training do you do when you're training for a mission that you don't know if it's even going to happen? Right. Well, there's some specific things like rendezvous training. That was something that we had to go through as a shuttle pilot. I had to learn that spacewalk training as a pilot, the shuttle pilots didn't do spacewalks, but they, I really wanted to do the training. And so they let, they let me do it. There were several others. One of the biggest was a Capcom training. And so I would go to Mission Control and work as what you call Capcom. That's the person in Mission Control that talks to the crew. So there's the flight control team. The flight director is the boss. He's in charge of everybody. All the different flight controllers or the engineers that track each specific system. And then the Capcom is a separate person that does the talking. And so the flight control team kind of figures out what's going on and then the Capcom is the is the translator between Mission Control and the crew. So I did that for years. I had several other jobs. I was in charge of our T-38 program, the, the jets that we fly. I worked as a support astronaut for some guys that were going into space. And so there, there's a variety of jobs you do. But the I mean, the best job to have is to be training for an actual space flight. Well, let's talk about the T-38s. I didn't really know much about this. These are the jets that you guys, the pilots, use to train for space flight. But like, what's the correlation there? Because flying on Earth right. is completely different from flying in space. Yeah. So it's the most important training we do. And you're exactly right. Like landing a T-38, the stick and rudder skills that you need, has nothing to do with space flight. But what does have to do with space flight is something called situational awareness, which is just kind of maintaining essay on what's happening now, on what's going to be happening in the future. We call it staying ahead of the jet. So if your airplane's flying along at 300 knots or 500 knots, your brain has to be in front of that, you know, thinking about where are we going to be? How much gas are we going to have? What's the weather going to be? Is the runway okay to land? It is shut down for some reason. And so this mental process of staying ahead of the jet, just thinking in the future is really important while your pink butt is on the line. So in a simulator, if you crash the shuttle, you hit the pause button, you crawl out, and you go to lunch. In a T-38, you can't do that. Like if Unless you land safely, you don't land safely. And so that, that training is all about the mental aspect of flying. Uh, we call it head work or just keeping SA like I talked about. And that's the best. Flying jets and airplanes in general is the best space flight readiness training, I think. Well, you mentioned flight simulators. And like if people have seen Apollo 13, they remember that, that famous scene where they just kept doing the simulations over and over again, where they just tried different things, different malfunctions. And they do that. I mean, so like, how long do you like, when you're preparing for a mission, like how much of your time was spent in the simulator? <laughs> all of it. <laughs> Not all of it, but a lot of it. And it's the long wait that I had before my first shuttle flight, it was actually pretty good because as a pilot, I got very comfortable with lots and lots of different malfunctions. And the space shuttle was incredibly complicated. It's it's the most amazing flying machine, most complicated flying machine man has ever built, for sure. And just being able to get comfortable with all the different computer malfunctions and electrical malfunctions and engine problems and all the stuff that the, our simulator supervisors, I, I think I wrote a chapter about that, they would dream up and throw, throw the kitchen sink at us. And so having that time And spending hours in the sim was really good. The most important part about it wasn't actually doing it. It was actually debriefing it. And that's the lesson. I I do a lot of corporate speaking. And that's one of the most important lessons to learn is that you really need to debrief whatever you're doing. If you're 
running a bank or you're making investment decisions or you're building, you know, construction homes or whatever. When you're done with something, you can't just go, well, that was, that was great. Move on to the next thing. You really should take some time to debrief it honestly, because that's the only way you get better. As a fighter pilot, that's, you know, part of the culture ingrained from day one. The gloves come off. There's no rank in the debrief. You, you, you know, br- debriefs should be brutal and, and honest and not just to tear someone down, but to get better and not make the same mistakes again. Right. After action reports, I've heard them called. After action reports in the military, we called, that's what they were called after action reports. Yeah. Very, very important. And, and again, not, don't do it just to kill people and fire people, but do it to, you know, get better and, and, and learn from mistakes. Right. Cause you have to do that because the, the risk is really high when, with space flight. With space flight, it is. And, you know, one of the lessons that I, that I really teach when I do this consulting is that just because something worked doesn't mean you made the right decision. You know, I'm a baseball guy, right? Just because you bunted with the bases loaded and your slugger up to bat and he got a hit doesn't mean that was the right decision, right? He probably should have swung away. Just because you flew the space shuttle for 20 years with foam falling off and it never killed anybody doesn't mean it was the right decision. It was the wrong decision and it eventually did kill the Columbia crew. For Challenger, just because you had been launching and there was gas leaking from the solid rocket booster and it never killed anybody, it was the wrong decision because it killed the Challenger crew. And so NASA's made some really spectacular mistakes that killed crews. And that lesson of, uh, so you really have to debrief it for, did we make the right decision? Not was it the right outcome? A lot of businesses will compensate executives based on stock performance, right? If your stock goes up, you get a bonus. Well, your stock might've gone up because it's 2018. (laughs) Or your stock might've gone down because it's 2009 or 2020. That doesn't mean you're a good manager or a bad manager. It just means that the calendar is what it is. And so you have to look deeper, like, were you making the right decisions, not what was the ultimate outcome? Because sometimes you get lucky and sometimes you get unlucky. <laughs> if I'm a baseball fan. The Astros have been getting extremely unlucky against the Tampa Bay Rays. And they just need to keep doing what they're doing because they're doing the right thing. So that concept of debriefing things and not doing it based on the outcome, but based on where you're making the right decisions is really, really important for fighter pilots and for astronauts and for anybody in business. One of the interesting chapters that I, I mean, it was pretty substantial too, is about survival training for astronauts. And I was thinking, why, <laughs> why would you have to like go to yeah. Alaska to learn like how to survive in the wilds? But it makes sense. Uh, like, so what contingency are you planning for there as an astronaut? And besides this like physical survival, what did the, the survival training, what other skills did it impart to you? Right. So that's a great point. Well, first of all, that chapter is half what it was originally. I wrote a really long chapter. I had to cut it in half. And there's there's two parts of the survival training that I had to do in my career. One was survival training. I mean, like as an Air Force pilot, if you eject over enemy lines, you, you had to survive and you had to evade. And then if you got captured, you had to resist. And so the, the training is called SIRI, Survival, Evasion, Resistance, and Escape. And, and I did that with the Air Force. And then I did it again with the French Air Force because I was on an exchange with them. And then I did part of it with the U.S. Navy because NASA sent us to do the same thing when we showed up to be astronauts. But then, and then with the Russian military, I also did winter survival and water survival in case the Soyuz landed in the snow or in the ocean. So I did all these different survival training. But then NASA sent us on a program called NOLS, National Outdoor Leadership School. And that was not necessarily this for survival skills. It was more for the emotional, mental aspect of being in a remote situation, having to take care of yourself, leadership and group dynamics and debriefing and giving each other feedback. And their real goal of Knowles was just to make us as miserable as possible so that we would kind of learn the, you know, you get to know each other. On the second time I did this trip, it rained every day for almost two weeks. And so, and by every day, I mean like all day, every day, 24 seven. So you kind of get to know each other (laughs) pretty well when you're suffering like that. And so there's really two different reasons, A, to survive, and B, to have this emotional group dynamics, you know, how do you get along when when life is tough? And they were all really good. And the, and the, the experiences in the mountains, in the Alaska, Prince William Sound kayaking is beautiful. I mean, unless you, sometimes you just need to get away from suburbia, where I'm guessing most of your podcast listeners are, that's where mm-hmm. I am, right? and uh, just get out and turn your phone off and, and look at nature. So did you do this, this Knowles thing with the people you would go up on your mission with? Well, yes, with the, it, it was supposed to be with more of them. And then they ended up, 
the crew changed, but I did, there were one or two folks. I think there were two other folks that I went with and the other six or seven ended up not being together, but and that was the original plan. So another part of this preparation, when you get ready for a mission, you go into detail about in the book is getting physically fit for it. And you might be thinking, well, you're in zero G, there's no like stress on your body. But like, <laughs> right. if you talk about space, like zero G actually puts a lot of stress <laughs> on your body. Um, so like, what's the physical fitness programming looking like? And what are you training for exactly when you train for going into outer space? Right. That So ironically, you're right. The pull-ups are easier in space, but everything else is harder. So you want to be just generally fit, you know, good cardiovascular. You want to have muscles, a lot of weightlifting and running. Anything where you're pounding your body is good for your bones because when bones get compression and when they get pounded, uh, they grow. When they are complacent and laying around and floating in zero G, they deteriorate, they shrink, you know, the, you have bone loss. So just basic fitness is one of the things, a specific reason to do the physical fitness training is for spacewalking and especially hand strength and forearm strength. Cause you're, you move with your hands and you do all your tasks with your hands and you're in this big, giant, bulky, couple hundred pound pressurized spacesuit that feels like metal and it's really hard to move. And so it's like having those balls that you can squeeze for stress relief or whatever for exercise at your desk for eight hours while you're in the suit. And so you're, especially your hands and fingers can get worn out. So the most important part of physical fitness was just to keep your body healthy and to prevent bone and muscle loss. And we do a lot of exercise in space. We, in, in space, there's a two and a half hour allotment every day of time for you to exercise. And so I was really diligent about that before they, they measured my bone density before the mission with this big x-ray machine called a DEXA scan. And then after my mission, 200 days in space, and I had lost 0.0% of my overall bone density, which was amazing to me. And the boat doctors were really surprised, but basically by doing diligent exercise every day, and I took a vitamin D pill every day, those two things kept my bones in good shape. My muscles were in good shape. There was a little bit of muscle loss, but I did 20 pull-ups the week I got back. You know, I, I came back in really good physical shape. So bones and muscles, that those problems have been solved, in my opinion, by the space station, by the protocols we've learned on the ISS. So like resistance training, how do you do this? Is it like, just, like, is it like a Bowflex type thing? Like you use resistance it bands? Is. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in the, the IMAX movie, I made A Beautiful Planet. There's a, there's a scene of Samantha, my crewmate, Samantha Christopheretti, exercising. So it's like a Bowflex, except for the Bowflex uses just springs, basically. You know, you bend metal and that creates force. In space, they have these cylinders. So it's a it's like a vacuum tube and you, you're pulling against the vacuum. And you can make a lot of force. I mean, for uh, deadlifts and squats, I think you could go up to 600 pounds. I never did, but I mean, that's dangerous. I mean, you could like crush yourself <laughs> under that thing. So you have, right. you really have to be careful. Uh, and, and the, you could do bench press and squats and deadlifts and crunches and curls and all the, the basic stuff you do in high school football, you know, you can do in space and it works. Like I said, I came back and, and it's kind of like going to a, a spa. I mean, if you eat healthy, there's no McDonald's, right? So it, it's reasonably healthy food and you do two and a half hours of exercise every day for half of the year. I came back in, in great shape. I mean, no fat. You know, I was muscular. It was it was pretty good. I mean, so you came out in good shape, but in, did you have any health issues while in space? Yeah, the the biggest thing for me was cancer. I got skin cancer after my shuttle flight, and then again after my space station flight. And I've still, in fact, I just had to set up my dermatology appointment because I got some some coming back. So uh, I think that's just a life after my space flights. That's something I'm just going to have to deal with for the rest of my life because of radiation. You know, in space even though that you're still protected by the magnetic field for the most part, you're not protected by the atmosphere and you get this stuff called galactic cosmic radiation that are really super high energy particles that they can mess with the DNA and your cells. And NASA really doesn't know how it affects us at all. They, they don't do like a before and after check of our DNA. That really kind of blew me away. I, I thought that there'd be a lot of research in that because it's, it's really the one and only problem. It's it's the 700-pound gorilla as far as longer duration human flights into the deep solar system is cancer, and NASA's not studying it at all. 
they do measure how much radiation we get, but they don't measure the effects of that radiation on our DNA. So I think that's, of all the questions that still need to be answered, how does radiation affect us? And trying to test out different ways to block it is probably the top question that needs to be answered. Well, okay, skin cancer, you're dealing with that. That's a big one. But I, th- I didn't know this about space travel, but like other astronauts get like just like rashes and just yes. <laughs> other stuff just happens to their skin. That's like, it's, it's kind of, it looks kind of gross. It's uncomfortable. I mean, it doesn't like, it's not affecting their health, right. but it's, sounds like it's uncomfortable and unpleasant. The rashes are interesting. Just about everybody I know has some kind of skin problem and it's interesting. And I, I was doing another interview with a med school this morning and they asked me that same question. I don't know why there is a different kind of biome on the space station. So there's different kind of funguses and stuff floating around up there. Your body is just behaving differently, you know, different hormones and organs are acting differently. So maybe that is part of it contributing. I don't know. I think, and I'm just a fighter pilot, I'm no doctor, but I think the lack of soap is is a problem. NASA did give me some soap, but not very much. You get like a bag of soap once every two weeks, like think Capri Sun, you know, the little juice boxes or something. Imagine having a juice box full of soap that you could squirt into a towel and wipe yourself down. Well, they were only giving it to us every, every two weeks. So that's not a lot of soap. And we had some like camping towels, these little small towels that they had some soap in them. So there was some soap. I just think if you had a better cleanliness, that might help. And I was the crew medical officer, so I was handing out, you know, supplies, drugs and stuff when when they were needed, but we really didn't have any good, like, skin cream and stuff. So if somebody had a problem, the NASA docs would go to the pharmacy, pick something out, and put it on the next cargo ship. So a few months later, you'd get a tube of cream for whatever. Yeah, that that was a weird one. I, I didn't really expect it, but the skin rashes. Like you said, that's not, you know, life-threatening, and you get back to Earth and that ends, but that was that was kind of an annoyance of spaceflight. Well, that's a, you, know, you brought this point of hygiene and how there might be a different biome up there. Because I think people typically think when they think of like, okay, space station, they think of like Stanley Kubrick or like an, <laughs> like it's like super clean and sleek and it's like right. an Apple device. But the way you describe it, a space station smells like a locker room, basically. <laughs> well, the- In a lot of places. The, uh, when you work out, it does. For the most part, it does. for the most part, the, the station is, you know, metal and plastic and that kind of stuff. But- your the gym clothes, like your Under Armour t-shirts and stuff, those things get pretty stinky after about a day or two. Although I did this one experiment for this wool infused fabric. Just think of an Under Armour t-shirt only with wool and less polyester. And I was worried that it would just itch and I would hate it. But oh my God, that shirt was amazing. I worked out every day drenching wet. Like just imagine going for a 30 minute run in the Houston humidity, how sweaty you'd be. And that's the way I got every single day in this shirt for every day for a month and it didn't stink at all. It was amazing. Like I couldn't believe this technology, but the station itself, it's not 2001 Stanley Kubrick. It's, um, it is, like you said, it is plastic and sterile materials, but there's so many wires and cables and laptops and boxes and cameras. And there's just so much stuff there. The clutter factor is pretty high. If you're like a, OCD neat freak, it, it's going to make your head explode because there's a lot of stuff just everywhere. Well, let's talk about a typical day. You mentioned you had two and a half hours a day allotted for exercise. Like right. how? So, what did your typical day look like? When did it start? And it, like, how do you manage like time in space when right? You know, you have, you might experience multiple sunrises and sunsets. So the sixteen of them a day, you go around the Earth sixteen times every twenty four hour period. So lots of sunrises and sunsets, but basically we had an Omega X33 watch and it had like every feature you could imagine. It's the most, it's the coolest watch. And so we set that to GMT. So basically, you know, London time and the day would start about 7.30 in the morning. We'd have a conference call with Houston and Moscow and Japan and Europe and Huntsville, Alabama, which is where the, the payloads, the NASA science is done out of Huntsville we call everybody, they you know, give us the, the briefing, and then we'd go work. And you work all day long, a couple hours of exercise. They're, they normally give you an hour break at some point to check your email and eat lunch and whatever. By the end of the day, you're done around 7 o'clock at night, and you have another conference, call everybody, Houston, Moscow, talk to everybody on Earth, and then you're done, and then you could make dinner. For me, by the end of the day, I'd usually have three or four or five or 10 little compact flashcards for my camera. 
So I would eat my dinner and then get to work downloading all those images that I had taken, maybe go take a few more images. We had Picasso was our software that they had for us. And so, you know, I'd look over the images, see what was good. If I found a good one, I, I emailed it. I had a guy at NASA that did my Twitter for me. So I would send him images and tell him what to tweet and and he would do the, you know, he would log on and actually tweet it. So I would send him the tweets and he would mechanically tweet it. And then I was always up super late. Samantha and I were both late night people that our crewmates were all early morning kind of guys, which actually worked out well because they would a lot of times wake up early and get their exercise done early. And that freed up the exercise equipment for us as because we, we were night owls. And so, and then do it again the next day. Usually got about six or seven hours of sleep a night. So by the weekend, I was exhausted. And Sundays, I, I just didn't set an alarm and I'd sleep until <laughs> 11 o'clock or noon or something like that. And catch up on my sleep and then get back to work on Monday. Okay. So you mentioned a lot of things that I think it'd be fun to talk about because this is like the stuff that people wonder about living in outer space. So you mentioned food, you had dinner. I think when people think space food, they think of like, for me, I go back to elementary school and like the tubes of like spaghetti (laughs) and a, and a a toothpaste tube or astronaut ice cream. I'd buy astronaut ice cream. Yeah. Right. Uh, Has that, has it improved since the eighties? So astronaut ice cream for me was Ben and Jerry's. So they have these freezers for biology experiments. So ast- blood and urine and saliva and, and rodents and plants and worms and all the different biology experiments we do, we freeze them, send them back to earth. So when they launched the, the freezers, they were empty. And so they would fill them up with ice. On one of the missions, they put some ice cream in there, which was super cool. So I got a picture of Chunky Monkey floating in the middle of the lab. It was, it's a great picture. <laughs> so that I, the, the astronaut ice cream you get at the Science Center is not, we don't have that for real. <laughs> Most of the food, it, if you were ever in the military or you see those little green bags of food, they're called MREs. Uh, we have the same thing. So basically MREs, you rip it open and eat it. You can warm it up if you want. You don't have to. And it's meat and potatoes and soup and vegetables and desserts just ready to go. The other type of food we have is dehydrated. So the, there's a food lab here in Houston and the ladies that work there, will they cook all different kinds of meat and potatoes and vegetables and fruits and dehydrate them. We stick it into a machine in space, fill it back up with water and wait about 10 minutes and it turns into food. And so those are kind of the two main types of food. There's also some just straight from the grocery store. So they would send us some bonus stuff like little bags of olives or tuna fish or uh, candy. I like chocolate. So Beth Turner was her name. The the support lady I had would send me lots of chocolate. So that's kind of the food. And at nighttime, I would, whenever I could, I would take my dinner, warm it up, put it in a big Ziploc and float down to the Russian segment where those guys were and have dinner with them because it's very easy for them to work on their modules. We work on our modules and we never see each other. And I really wanted to have one crew so I made it a point to go down and spend as much time as I could with with my Russian colleagues. And that was the highlight of my time in space was hanging out with those guys. We had we had a lot of fun, for sure. It sounds like there was some bartering, too, of food between the two countries. <laughs> there was. Yeah. Well, it, it worked out really well because I started this bag. I wrote down, like, uneaten food. So stuff that we didn't like and uh, on the American side. And by American, it means not Russian, uh, Japanese and Europeans, whatever. So whatever we didn't like, like the curry vegetables, I just couldn't take. We had 500,000 things of coffee and tea. It was too much. There, there was just a few foods that we didn't like. And every week or two weeks, those guys would, the Russians would come down and raid that bag. And they basically ate everything that we didn't like. They liked it. And we would go down there and, and we would get fish from them. Like we didn't have any fish on our side. It was weird. They had so many like cans of fish and meat and they got tired of eating cans of canned meat <laughs> for three meals a day, but we loved it. So it was actually a really good system. It gave, they got some variety. We got some variety. And as far as I know, for 200 days, no one ever threw any food away. We just ate, ate the other guy's food and it worked out really well. So you mentioned sleep. Was sleeping a problem? Like, did you like have problems staying asleep on the space station? I was worried about that and I didn't. My sleep in space was so good. I mean, I just was out and slept perfectly. In fact, I did an experiment on the shuttle and uh, it was before there was Apple watches and Fitbits. They had this, uh, they call it an active watch. And my sleep on earth was kind of, you know, up and down and up and down and a little fitful. 
in space, it was just flatline. You know, I was out. So sleeping in space is awesome. There's something that's so cool about floating. We each had our crew quarters, which was super important psychologically. So I would just zip myself up in my sleeping bag and float. I wasn't attached to anything. I was literally just floating in this little phone booth size thing. And it was so awesome. It was really cool. Did you have like space lag when you first got up there? On my shuttle flight, we had sleep shifted. So we spent about a week or two transitioning our our wake up time. It was like a 12 hour sleep shift. It was painful. So we were, I was kind of already adjusted to the new schedule and the way the Russians do it, you don't sleep shift. You just pull an all nighter and (laughs) you slam shift once you get there. So, but it didn't take, it wasn't a problem. I just felt falling asleep was, was easy. Now I felt dizzy. I felt terrible. So on my first flight, on my second flight, when I went back, my brain was used to it. it. It knew what space was, but on my first flight, it took me about two days to get adjusted to the dizziness. Let's talk about going to the bathroom because the thing I remember going to bathroom space, I think it's from space camp for that 1980. <laughs> I just remember like the vacuum cleaner and I'm like, I don't know if that, I don't know about that. Is that what it's still like? <laughs> it's all about airflow. Yeah, it is. I mean, it, you know, if there's not airflow, there's no gravity to keep everything going in the right direction. So airflow is the, is the secret sauce that makes sure everything moves in the right direction. So yeah, that's that's what does it. There's a hose for number one and a can for number two, <laughs> but the key parts of both of those are airflow. So there's like an emergency procedure. If the fan stops when you're in the middle of it, you gotta, you know, shut the hatch immediately and do a couple things. <laughs> that's a that's an emergency procedure you want to have memorized. You don't want to have to get the checklist out in case the fan died in the middle of your operation. And like, what happens to the like, the waste? Like, particularly the number two, is, yeah. is there like lat- like latrine duty, like in Boy Scouts, where you had to clean things up? The the basic handshake was when the can's full, you empty it. So, and just like for food, when the food bag's empty, you trash it and get a, go get a new one out. And that takes it's a pain. You got to go dig around. It's a ten or fifteen minute thing. But the the toilet can was so the. Urine, the hose goes into a recycling system and the American segment has this amazing water reclamation system, So, which is amazing. It saves a lot of money because it's probably forty or $50,000 per liter of water. So it's a very expensive to launch it. So the recycling is super important. But number two just goes in a can. Uh, it's a Russian KTO can and you seal it torque it down with a torque wrench and put it in this big giant uh, bag. Like it's bigger than a washing machine full of these poop cans. And then every few months, a progress, which is a Russian cargo ship would go, you know, deliver us supplies. We'd fill it up with trash and it would go back to earth. And so, and burn up in the atmosphere. So if you ever see one of these vehicles burning up and there's, there's, you know, streaks of fire across the sky, you'll know, <laughs> you'll know what that, what that fire is made There's of. There's poop in there. <laughs> yes. That is poop. I'm going to tell my son that he'll get a kick out of that. So, I mean, I, I imagine like yeah, people who become astronauts, they're very intelligent, they're skilled, they're masters of what they do when they're crafted, they, they're trained. There's like one component that it's hard to train for, maybe. It's like the psychological mm-hmm. component. Like what psychological toll does can space travel have on people? And this is actually becoming more of a concern as we're thinking about going to Mars or whatever. Right. I think it's the biggest issue. And and that's why NASA sent us on those Knowles experiences. I, I think it's a very big deal. Part of it is just your personality. You know, some people are laid back, some people can roll with punches, some people are uptight. And in in the movies, you always have the screaming astronauts and do this and get over here now and blah, blah, blah. That's not the guy that you want to fly into space with. You'd rather have the calm, you know, not get flustered kind of personality. But you need to learn how to have feedback with each other that's not terrible. You know, like, hey, can you stop doing this? It's really bugging me. Um, Because otherwise, they'll keep doing it. It'll really bug you and it could turn into an explosion and you don't want that. So I actually did a program at Harvard Business School years and years ago. And that was the best space station commander training I ever had uh, that semester I spent at Harvard. Because they spent a lot of time on that fuzzy, soft skills that, you know, especially as guys... Is I was a fighter pilot. I'm like, just put me in charge. Everything will be good. That's all we need to worry about. <laughs> Before I did the program at Harvard. And then afterwards, I realized, hey, you know what? If you have a group, if you have a team, there's you could probably make, have, make better decisions if you use your team properly. And feedback was a big part of that. So 
that was definitely a learning and maturing experience for me. But I was lucky. The, the crew I had when I was commander on Expedition 43, the crew was really good. And uh, we got along well. And there was problems, of course, and but nothing big. And the as a, as, a, as a group, we're still good friends to this day, which is pretty awesome. So you got to do a spacewalk, which isn't, you said, it's not very common for pilots to do. Yeah. What was that like experience? I mean, was did you have that sort of like, you know, a spiritual, existential, on-spine experience? I had this one moment, 99% of it was work. I never felt so on the clock. I mean, it's worse than NFL draft because it's dangerous. Like you want to get back in as soon as you can. And I just didn't have any time at all. And so there was this one moment I had finished, we were plugging in cables and I was done with mine. I was waiting on my p- partner and I stopped and I, I just turned around and I had had a face full of metal for hours. I mean, even though you're in space, you're looking at the station, you're plugging in equipment, that's what you're focused on. So I turned around and the sun was rising and it was this, from one side of my peripheral vision to the other was the earth limb with the thin atmosphere and it was going from blue and then it turns this orange, red, pink, you know, rainbow of colors. It was so gorgeous. It was like I could hear God and I was seeing something that humans weren't meant to see. And then I had to get back to work because I had to plug in my next cable. So it was like the most extreme, sublime to mundane swing you can imagine. And that's the way space travel was. For my first minutes on my first shuttle flight, all the way through seven months in space, I would have these 99% working on boring metal equipment boxes to, I'm seeing God here. You know, it was, it was really quite an emotional swing, but it was pretty awesome. And seeing that outside while I'm actually out in space was amazing. Well, it's kind of comforting because I think, uh, <laughs> cause that's like life on earth. Like you'll have moments where it's just like, oh, this is amazing. Right. You see you're a child born or something. Right. And then it's just the next, the next thing, the next minute you're picking a social security number for your kid right. and whatever. <laughs> it's exactly. that's, that's what space is like. <laughs> so that's what life's like. Okay. It is. Oh, I mean, it, it and is. like when you got back from space for, you're there for 200 days, it sounds like you didn't like physical, like adaptation getting back wasn't too bad. Not, not too much muscle deterioration, no bone deterioration. Did you have any problems adjusting back to gravity? The biggest thing for me, I felt heavy. You know, I felt really heavy and I was super, super, super dizzy. I was able to walk around. I was able to move around. I, you know, I didn't get sick or anything, but I felt like it. If I would have just sh- shook my head, I would have barfed for sure. And I always wanted either a handrail or somebody next to me. I never fell, but it sure did feel like I was going to. The first day back was like a couple bottles of wine. The second day back was like a bottle of wine. I mean, I was pretty dizzy. The third day back was like a couple glasses of wine. Uh, I landed in Kazakhstan 24 hours later in three flights on a business jet. I was back in Houston. I went right to the gym to do my rehab. And then my son had gotten his driver's license while I was in space. And so he, he said, hey, dad, let's go car shopping. So we, he drove, he took me to the Ford dealer and we looked at pickup trucks. And I remember thinking, I'm back on earth and it's great. Like I was worried that I'd be depressed and I'd miss it. And I what didn't at all. It was just great to be back on earth. So I thought it was going to be a psychological problem. It wasn't. And the, the dizziness only took a few days. Do you, do you still have like a, I mean, you, so you didn't have any problems adjusting. You didn't have that letdown, but do you still like yearn to get back up there? You know, not really. Okay. I, I spent seven months there. It was great, but life on earth is great too. You know, there's things on earth that I didn't get in space. And so it was, you know, if I could go make a movie, actually I would do that, but I'm happy to be on earth. There's a lot of things I want to do. There's a lot of projects I have going on. And I, I think it's important to have something to look forward to. I, that's not a lot of my colleagues suffer from, they, they need to go back. They need to go back. They want to do it again. It's a powerful drug. Space is a powerful drug. And for me, luckily I have a, I have the mindset that, you know, that was cool. I'm glad I did it. Now I want to do other things. I, after my first flight, I want, I wanted to fly again. I wasn't sure what I was going to do when I grew up. I actually went to Harvard for a semester and and when I went there, I realized, hey, there's some pretty cool things that to be done on Earth, but I'm, but I want to fly again. So I went and I flew again. And it, at that point, I was in my 40s. I was still energetic and I had ambition, and 
I wanted to do this and that. And, you know, there's some business projects I want to do. There's, the, I'm writing this book and I have some film and TV that I want to do. So I said, it's time to leave. And I've done everything there is to do. I was a station commander. I did spacewalks. I was a shuttle pilot. I mean, I've done everything there is. Um, there are the new cap, the Boeing and the SpaceX capsules are coming out, but they're not really that interesting because you you literally don't do anything. You just sit there and ride and the, they're 100% automated. So as a test pilot, that wasn't really that exciting to me. So I just decided it was time. And I'd been there for 16 years. It was, you know, I had a long career at NASA. So you don't, you definitely don't want to leave that too soon. But in my mind, I didn't want to leave too late either. You know, I didn't want to be 60 years old, hanging on for another flight. It was, it was the right time for me. And what do you think is the future of manned space flight? I mean, there's all this talk about going back to the moon, Mars. Is that going to happen? Do you think it should happen? I mean, it's. I mean, of course, these are these are political debates too, policy debates. But I mean, as someone who's been to space, what's your take? Yeah, <laughs> I spoke at the White House two years ago to the Vice President and the National Space Council, and my message for him was: it's not about the rocket science; it's about the political science. Um, that's what that's what really drives these programs. So. I th- I think Mars should be our long-term goal and I think the moon is a is a great testing ground and stepping stone to get to Mars. I think you need a build-up approach, but I also think that the nation is really badly in debt right now and and we were badly in debt a year ago and now after coronavirus it's um you know, it's it's a problem. It's it's a problem. It's probably the the number one global security problem is the American debt because if America's hampered because and we can't act because of our debt, then that allows other nations that don't share our democratic values to to take over. And so we ne- we need to get our debt under control. So I don't think there's going to be a lot of additional discretionary spending on NASA in the coming decade or two. The good news is we have a private sector and they're very innovative and they can do things much quicker and much faster than the government. I think that if we can figure out how to do public private partnerships right, I think the future of space travel can be really exciting. I know Jim Bridenstine, he's the current NASA administrator, and I know he is really focused on this. So I think that's a a good positive thing, but I don't think the NASA budget is going to be exploding anytime soon. Well, Terry, this has been a great conversation. Where can people go to learn more about the book? And I also know, in addition to the IMAX film you made, A Beautiful Planet, you also recently made a film about setting the world record for the fastest pole-to-pole circumnavigation of the Earth via jet. So where can people go to learn all about that? So How to Astronaut, I always encourage folks to go to their local bookstore. It's any any bookstore in, in America and, and many around the, the English-speaking world will have it. You can always get it on Amazon or, or Barnes & Noble, et cetera. How to Astronaut, it's a lot of fun. You know, I wrote this book to make people laugh and say, wow. 51 short chapters. It should be easy to read. It's not a technical book. It's a great Christmas gift, Father's Day gift, Mother's Day gift. So How to Astronauts out there. And then One More Orbit, the movie that we made, I th- is really cool. I think it's the movie that we need in 2020. It's about this exploration, this drama of setting the world record, but it's really about how these eight people from eight different countries came together during Apollo That brought the world together. We took off and landed from the Kennedy Space Center on the anniversary of Apollo 11. So it's about how exploration brings us together. So it's like a fun, little bit of drama, positive movie. I think it's great for kids and adults. So One More Orbit is out there on iTunes and Amazon and I think 20 different, you know, pay-per-view channels. Fantastic. Well, Terry Virts, thanks for his time. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me. My guest today was Terry Virts. He's the author of the book, How to Astronaut. You can find it at amazon.com and bookstores everywhere. You can also find out more information about his work at his website, terryvirts.com. Also check out our show notes at aom.is slash astronaut, where you can find links to resources where you can delve deeper into this topic.